Hello, this is Dr. Christy Patton Lukes, a chemical engineering professor at Missouri S&T. We are looking at chemical process design using the textbook by Turton et al. At this point, we're ready to look at chapter 11, which is utilizing experience-based principles to confirm the suitability of a design. So basically what we're doing here is using heuristics, or as they say, experience-based principles that will help guide us as we are making choices in our designs. Now, a heuristic or an experience-based principle is not a theory, it's a rule of thumb. So it's not necessarily going to be the only correct answer. And at times you're going to see things that contradict each other. But what they do is they give you a starting point and they can save you time in, when you come up with answers that are, to someone with more experience, a ridiculous answer. Now this material actually complements what we did when we were in Chapter 6. In your book, in the fifth edition, we are looking at pages 354 to 367. And we'll quickly look through those, and then in class we'll also look at some that are in the book by Cider. So we're just going to go through a few of these in this video lesson. Um, and I'm not going to read everything to you, but when you're doing physical properties, obviously we're going to do predicted properties like, you know, in our Aspen simulations or whatever, and it will get me values that vary with temperature and pressure. But a lot of times I need to be able to do just a quick hand calculation. So what should you use? Well, these are some typical values of what you should expect to be the answer. And so it gives you a nice starting point. There are capacities of process units that are commonly used. So for vessels that are going to be horizontal, we usually use from vacuum up to 400 uh, bar pressure. But for a vertical vessel, we're not going to typically go to that, um, and that 400 there is a typo. But anyway, we're not going to be going to vacuum typically on a vertical vessel, uh, just because it's harder to do. And we've got temperature ranges of what are typical. Same for towers, pumps, etc. So what are typical ranges that would be used? And typical materials of construction. In general, we want to use whatever is cheapest but resistant enough to withstand degradation or unsafe operations, etc. And so therefore, there's a list here of what might be useful. You know, so for instance, they talk about glass. We use it all the time in labs. And you might if you're doing a batch system. But it's not very good for things that are going to, you know, occasionally be bumped by, you know, the man lift or something like that. They're going to be fragile and they're not good for heat transfer. So for the various chem... Uh, materials of construction, they list the most common ones here and what are some of the advantages and disadvantages. Turbines and motors, we don't study those in great depth. We know that they are, you know, not 100% efficient because no device is. And so they give guidelines of what you should expect as the range of values for those and how to relate the power de that's delivered to a fluid compare that to shaft power, compare that to the drive power, because each of those has an efficiency. So there's a loss, a mechanical loss. And, and so that overall efficiency is going to be a product of the shaft power efficiency and the drive power efficiency. And then there are rules for process vessels. At this point, we just know that vessels exist, but we haven't really talked about how they're sized. And so how big do you need it to be? Well, as they say, like look at number six here. In a drum feeding a furnace, you usually say 30 minutes for a half full drum. 
okay? Because you want to have enough fuel so that if there's some disruption in service, you don't have everything knocked out of system. And we have all sorts of different kinds of devices that we use drums for. Pressure vessels, how are we going to derive or dis design those? And storage vessels. Piping, we know how to derive formulas that, you know, for pressure drop or linear velocity to mass flow. But how do they know what linear velocity they should have? Okay. Normally, we want linear velocities in liquids to be, you no, know, say, in the single digit range. And it, for a gas stream, we want it to be in the double digit range. That would be meters per second here. And how much pressure drop is acceptable across a control valve? etc. So those things are listed here under the heuristics for piping. And of course if you have piping then you also need insulation. And so again we have some heuristics here. What style of insulation do you want for what temperature range? So guidelines here. We know how to do the calculations for how thick you need it to be but how do you choose which insulation? So I'm going to close this video lesson. We'll come back and look at some of the um, more uh, chemical engineering design oriented uh, systems, reaction, reactors, separation devices, etc. in the next lesson. Thank you very much for your time.